Let's pray. I guess as we pray, I just want to give a, a moment of quiet, just reflection. Um, maybe there's something in your life that is robbing you of peace this moment, and I want you to bring that to the Lord as we come to his word together. And, and he, he wants you to experience peace. That's, that's his will for you and for me and for us. And whatever that is that's in your way, uh, God wants to minister and speak to that area of your life today. And so it's your opportunity now just to bring that concern, that worry, that fear to him today. Father, guide us in the way of peace today. Guide us to the Prince of Peace. Remove distractions in our hearts and lives and help us to just discover the wonderful peace that you have for those that know you. So, thank you for this season of peace. Guide us in your truth now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We got the youth row up here. I don't know if you noticed the second row, they're full of our youth here. It's pretty awesome. It's a good sign in a church when you see a group of young people that are uh, playing, serving upstairs. They serve downstairs. Last time we had lunch with a bunch, I looked in there and there were a couple of our youth washing dishes. That's a really good sign. I mean, this is the future leaders of our church and of church across Canada and the world right here. So awesome. That's why New Life invests in youth ministry and in youth pastors. And John, Pastor John has done a great job. I mean, these are missionaries. He's taken them to like some really hostile places like Winnipeg and uh, <laughs> San Diego. And, and, you know, so, I mean, we're proud of our youth. We had them over at our house on Friday night, and we, we had a lot of time, and, and a good time with them. There are some hidden talents in our youth group. Uh, we had a cookie decorating contest. Now, when I was in youth group, I, I kind of skipped that activity, you know, but uh, we got some guys in our youth group that are really good at decorating cookies. You wouldn't believe it. So anyway, we had a good time. Um, we're talking about peace today. And peace is one of those kind of big ideas, right? It kind of shows up, uh, you know, it's sort of the running joke, right, at beauty pageants, right? You know, what, what, you know, what, what, what do you hope for in the world? Well, world peace, right? It's kind of the, you know, that token answer. When I was in high school, these guys showed up in our town. I, I was in the Kootenays at the time. A an area where a bunch of Russian immigrants had, had immigrated to back many, many years ago, uh, a group called the Dukabors, and there was a, a, a sect of them called the Freedomites. I don't know. Anyone know the Freedomites? So, so you know, the old people would know. The Freedomites were, they, they were peace-loving people, but they would protest. And, and the way they would protest is they would take off all their clothes and march in the streets, right? And, and these large Russian women were marching in the streets, and of course the police officers were like, how do you arrest that? You know, like it's sort of <laughs> kind of awkward, you know, and they were peace, you know, loving peace. And they would do strange things like burn their houses down to, to you know, protest against war. I mean, it was just really weird. But anyway, in 1991, these guys showed up in town to have a peace rally. Uh, there were these guys, probably young 20s, and, and all of us high school students were really intrigued by this. Of course, what we were intrigued about was the fact that we could actually skip school to go on this peace march, right? So these guys were selling pins, and we had this little peace march, yada, yada, yada. And, and now that I'm an adult and I look back and I think, you know, if I was a parent, I'd be like, hey, who are these guys, right? I mean, what kind of young 20-year-old guys who aren't working, wander around, going to high school, selling peace pins and organizing peace marches? It was really weird, but maybe it was the fact that we kind of were in this town which had this history of pacifism. I don't know, but... For one day, we skipped school and did a peace march. The next day was life as normal, and there was less, there wasn't any less war than there was the day before, but there was this very small focus on peace, but it didn't bring any peace. As you get older, you discover that peace is, is more than just the absence of war. Peace is also this, this inner rest in your soul that, that you just long to not have the grind of life, you know, pressuring you all the time, and so you, you look for peace. And, and then we travel for peace, right? We go to Mexico to find peace. We, we go to retreats. We go to yoga. We go to all sorts of things to try to find peace. And, and we can't find it. Or we find it for a moment and, th and then it's gone. And you know, this has been a problem that our world has faced for, for, for centuries. And the Jewish people long for peace. They long for that day of, of security and stability. And so when John the Baptist is born, 
his father Zechariah speaks this, this prophetic word in Luke chapter 1. And in the end of this prophetic word is this message of peace. And you've got to understand that for 400 years or longer, the, the Jewish people hadn't heard any word from God, no prophets, kind of silence. And, and, and Zechariah breaks the silence here in, in Luke chapter 1 and verses 68 to 79. This is the first word from God that people have heard in hundreds of years. And this is what he says. He's, he's been silent for, for nine months or more. He's, he hasn't been able to speak. He, his son is born. They ask his mom, what are you going to name him? She's like, we're going to name him John. They're like, there's no one in your family named John. Why are you naming him John? Dad asked for a tablet. He writes down, his name is John. Once, and the moment he writes it, all of a sudden, boom, his tongue is open, and this is what comes out of his mouth. He says, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, because he has come to help and has redeemed his people. For he's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets long ago, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. He has done this to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham. This oath grants that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, may serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him as long as we live. Now, it sounds very nationalistic. It is nationalistic. Jesus is the king of the Jews. And, and to this day, the Jews still long for that, that peaceful security of their land, and, and they still fight hard to, to protect their borders. But, but here they are. But, but then it gets a little more personal. He says, and you, child, he's referring to John, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of our God's tender mercy, the dawn will break upon us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. It's interesting. He goes from this nationalistic vision of salvation from enemies and to this personal thing about forgiveness of sins, uh, getting out of the the darkness and and, and entering that dawn of a new era and, and walking in this way of peace. And for people who are subjugated by the Roman government, I mean, they would long for this peace, but, but he's not talking about that kind of peace. He's talking about this, this deep peace of the soul, knowing that you are right with God. That John would go ahead to prepare people for, for Jesus and the message of peace that, that he was about to bring. And the reality is, is that peace, the prospect of peace is enticing. Of not having conflict, right? I mean, can you imagine, right? I mean, maybe some of you are are dreaming about a Christmas where there is no fighting. (laughs) The kids aren't fighting. Mom and dad aren't fighting. Parents aren't fighting with children. Grandparents, I mean, you know, cousins, uncles. I mean, you just think, it would be nice to have a family Christmas without any quabbling, right? And the reality is, it's impossible, right? Someone's going to be upset. Maybe they don't say it, but they don't, but, but, but they do what they don't, you know, communicates what they're upset. And, and we have all these, these issues, and, and we know it, right? Or maybe you enter Christmas knowing that there's just problems in your life that you cannot fix. And for that very reason, you cannot enter that place of peace because, like, there is this insurmountable problem, this, this issue in my life. This person that I just can't get things right with. This, this broken relationship that will never be made right. And, and as a result, my Christmas is forever fractured. And how do we find peace in that? Maybe it's, it's your own job situation. Like, you know what? This is not getting better. It's not, you know, it's, it's not going away. I can't fix it. I need this job. I just have to struggle with life and accept it. Maybe it's your health. Something in your life just not working out physically, and you're like, okay, I'm, it's never going to get better. I'm going to just have to live in this torture for the rest of my life. And as a result, it robs you of your peace. And then Zechariah has the audacity to come along and say, Jesus will lead you into this path of peace. You see, because the reality is that peace is elusive. I mean, world peace is elusive. Uh, you know, the United Nations was started, you know, over 70 years ago, and since that period of time, they've spent over half a trillion dollars trying to bring peace to the world. The, the budget this year is $6.7 billion, and it's not, go- it's not getting better. The budget goes down, but, but we're, not, we're not finding peace. 
I, I looked up this idea of peace and, and, and the cost of, of war in 2015. They, they said the, the cost, economic impact of violence to the global economy was $13.6 trillion. They figured that if you average that out to the, to, the, to the population of the world, that's $5 a day per person in the whole world that it costs. War costs us. How do we find peace in that? Well, so I went in, online, and of course, you know, everything on the internet's true, right? <laughs> and I, I found these quotes about peace, right? So, so here's what the world offers us for peace. George Michael, great philosopher, said, you'll never have peace of mind until you listen to your heart. Mm. The Dalai Lama said, don't let the behavior of others destroy your inner peace, right? Don't let it destroy your inner peace, right? Peace is the result of retaining, ret retraining your mind to process life as it is, rather than as you think it should be. Now, whatever that means, right? So, you know, just wander around in circles, and eventually, eventually you'll find this elusive peace. Eckhart Tolle, uh, kind of a humanistic kind of philosopher whose books are sold at Costco, right? So kind of a popularist, uh, kind of a spiritual writer. You'll find peace, by, not by rearranging the circumstances of your life, but by realizing who you are at the deepest level. You know, discover that inner person. Now, I, I would suggest that when you discover that person, that you're, what you're going to find is not peace, but horror. <laughs> but according to Eckhart Tolle, you know, you, you can find peace that way. John F. Kennedy said, peace is a daily, a weekly, a monthly process gradually changing opinions, slowly eroding old barriers, quietly building new structures. It's kind of this grind of just keep working at it, keep working at it, keep working at it, keep working at it. Linda Evans said, if there's no inner peace, people can't give it to you. The husband can't give it to you. The children can't give it to you. You have to give it to you. So you're kind of the author of your own peace story, right? Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said the same thing. Nobody can bring you peace but yourself. Peace is its own reward, said Mahatma Gandhi. If you cannot find peace within yourself, you will never find it anywhere else, Marvin Gaye. And that, that's, that, that's actually haunting words. If you cannot find peace within yourself, you will never find it anywhere else. And of course, this represents kind of the spirit of our age. We don't realize that somewhere within all of us, there does exist a supreme self who is eternally at peace. That's Elizabeth Gilbert in Eat, Pray, and Love. Somewhere within you is this, this supreme self that, that is eternally at peace. And so, so this is why we haven't found peace. Because the more we look in ourselves, we find it's not there. But, but we're told it's there. And so we keep looking for this peace, and it's not there. And, and so do you wonder why people get to the end of, their, uh, of themselves and then take their lives? Why? Because they, it's not there. And for this reason, the Scripture, the Holy Word of God, the eternal Word of God says that there is actually a path to peace. And this path to peace is not found looking deep within your recesses of your soul because if you really honestly look within the recesses of your soul, what you find there is horrific and, sc and scary and frightening. It's selfish. It's, it's evil. It's ugly. And we need to look outside of ourselves to find peace peace that God wants you to, to experience. In the Hebrew, the idea of peace was different than the absence of war. It was the word shalom. You know, it's, it's a greeting. You, you would say even today, shalom, you know, peace, my friend. It, it's a wholeness. It's, it's the whole part of your, of your being, living in harmony with, with, with yourself and with God and with others. It's sort of when everything is right, peace. You know, moving up and out. You know, the great commandment that Jesus says, love the Lord your God by your heart, soul, mind, and strength, your labor of yourself. That is the idea of peace, is that you, things are good with God, things are good with others. It's no wonder we don't experience peace is because we, we miss this connection with God and then we miss the connection with others. The verse that was read at the, at the Advent reading, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, tell us that the way to peace is found in Jesus. For to us a child has been born, a child has been given to us, he shoulders responsibility, and this is a net translation, he shall be called extraordinary strategist or wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
And then he describes what does that Prince of Peace look like, verse 7. His dominion will be vast and will bring immeasurable prosperity or peace. He will rule on David's throne and David's kingdom, establishing and strengthening it by promoting justice and fairness from this time forward and forevermore. The Lord's intense devotion to his people will accomplish this. He's like, things are going to change with this new king, the Prince of Peace. You see, the way to peace is found in Jesus. We need a leader to bring peace. You know, as a kid, I, I grew up and, and I can remember watching the news, you know, black and white, small little screen TV, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, kind of not big like it was today, but, you know, it, it, always someone going over to the Middle East to try to, to bring peace, right? There was always someone trying to negotiate a new peace accord, and, and it never happened, right? But, but Jesus comes as the Prince of Peace the ruler of peace, to establish peace. And of course, how he does it is, is in the most unexpected way. He comes and he, ho- he goes to the cross. And he offers himself as a sacrifice for sin once and for all. And he makes the way possible for us to discover peace with God, to, to restore the vertical relationship, to, to, to have that, that peace with God. So Romans 5, chapter 1 and 2 tells us, therefore, since we've been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it continues, and it says, through whom we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, in which we, and we rejoice in the hope of God's glory. It's like, you know, we have peace with God. Like, the, the reason we don't experience peace is because we've got this fractured relationship with the Creator. And Jesus comes and he dies on a cross. And those who have faith in Jesus Christ reestablish the link with God and find peace. People don't have this kind of peace. You know, as a pastor, you know, I, I get called to the hospital, someone's dying, right? And, there, and there's, different, there's different ways. Some, some that have this peace, there's almost like a smile on their face because they are anticipating Jesus. Because that peace is there. They're not afraid. Jesus took the punishment for their sin. They're not worried about the guilt, the shame, the, the garbage that they did in their life because they knew that when they came to faith in Christ and confessed their sin, God forgave it and that they had peace with God. And so they're ready. They're like, yes, I'm ready to go. And they, they, there's this, it's, it's surreal. People that haven't dealt with that, you go to their bedside and, and, and there, there's a, a worry. There, there's just like this, the sense of, I don't know what's going to happen. And as a pastor, I, I want to bring them to the place of, you can have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Jesus establishes peace with God for us when we come to him. But not only that, Jesus also enables us to have peace with one another. Ephesians 2, verses 13 to 18 tells us that. But now in Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. Now, he's talking about the, the Jews and the, the non-Jews, what they call the Gentiles. He's like, yeah, we've got these two different groups, and, and if you've lived in Israel, you know, like, you know they're kind of separated. A Jew won't eat with a Gentile, and he won't touch them, and there are certain things. He's like, but, but now in Christ, peace has been made. The one who made both groups into one and destroyed the middle wall of partition, the hostility, it says. Continue in verse 15. When he nullified in his flesh the law of commandments and decrees, he did this to create in himself one new man out of two, thus making peace. And to reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by which the hostility has been killed. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. So that through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. He's made peace. So now here we have a church where every ethnicity is welcome. There is no gender differentiation when it comes to to being part of God's family, men and women, young and old, your color of your skin, your educational level, your social status, your, your, your annual income. It doesn't matter. In Christ, we are one. Christ has brought peace. Amen. Isn't that great? Like, I mean, so, so we're together, right? Everyone is welcome. Everyone's a part. Everyone is equal in this family because, because Christ has made that peace possible. In the past, you had to be Jewish. 
You, you, you had to, you know, and, and, and even in the temple, you know, you could worship God, but, but there, were, there were barriers, right? I mean, if you, were, if you were a Gentile, you could come this far in the temple, right? There was a court of the Gentiles, and then there was a court of the Jewish women, so the women, the Jewish women could kind of go a little further, and then there was the court of the, the Jewish men, but the women were left behind, and then, of course, there was the, the court only the priests could enter, and then, then there was the temple where, where only the high priests could enter, and the Holy Holies only once a year, and so the closer you got to God's presence, the, the fewer people could get there, but now in Christ... The partition, the walls have been broken down. We all gather together. Gentiles, women, men, priests, your lineage, your economic status, everyone together. Christ has established peace with each other. Not only that, he gives us peace when things aren't easy. You see that in, in John chapter 16, verse 33? I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you're going to have trouble and suffering, but take courage. I have conquered the world. So here's the issue. We think peace means that, that there's no trouble in our world, no trouble in our life, no, no struggles, no stress, no anxiety. That's not true. Jesus is like, you're going to have trouble, but when you have me, you have peace in the midst of your trouble. Remember the disciples in the boat? You know, they're going across the Sea of Galilee. It's not a very big sea, but it gets pretty, pretty raucous at times, and and Jesus is sleeping in the stern, and they're like, oh, man, we're going to die. What's happening? Jesus, wake up. What's going on? He's like, well, guys, what's your problem? Like, I'm here with you. Like, what are you worried about, you know? And gets up, yeah, peace, be still. And boom, the, the, the waves stop. And they're like, what's going on here? Jesus is like, you can have peace when you have me in your life, even though life is difficult, right? Your school is tough. Kids in your school aren't going to respect your Christian faith. People at work are going to be like, yeah, you're, you're just strange because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Your family, some of your family members are going to be like, yeah, you're just a little bit too over the top and, and way too into this Christian stuff. You know, why don't you just you know, quit, quit being holier than thou or whatever. You know, they're going to, you know, they're going to push you. You're going to find pressure because you're, you're going to do the right thing. Maybe others around you are, are doing the wrong thing and you're the, you're the person saying, no, we've got to do it right. And, and you feel that pressure, right? You're, no, I'm not going to fudge my, my numbers here for you. I'm not going to alter my timesheets. I'm going to do it right. I'm going to be true. I'm going to be integral. And, and you're going to find that there's a challenge. But Jesus said, don't worry. When you have me, you have peace. Jesus gives us peace when things are not easy. When you sit this Christmas, separated from your family because of divorce, breakup, death, whatever it is, Jesus still promises to be with you and to give you his peace. Even though the bank account is showing a negative number, <laughs> the peace is, is still available for you. Even though your health situation isn't turning around, his peace is still promised for you. Even though we look at our province and we look at our country and we wonder what's going on, we don't let that throw us down because we have the Prince of Peace in our lives. Okay? New government's not going to bring us peace, provincially or federally. Only Jesus brings us the peace that we really need. Jesus also gives us the peace to live in unity in the church. It says in Colossians 3.15, you'll see that up here. Let the peace of Christ be in control of your heart. For you are in fact called as one body to this peace and be thankful. Now, the your there is a plural your. It's not just your heart, you know, little Mike's heart. It's, it's our heart, your heart. The reason churches fight with each other and squabble and are critical and complain is because the peace of Christ is not ruling in our hearts. You have to let the king, the prince of peace, come in and say, I'm going to establish my rule of peace in your heart so that you can live that peace with each other. We are going to irritate each other, people. We're going to tick each other off. We're going to say things that offend each other at times, and that is life in relationship in a sinful world. But we, when the peace of Christ rules in our hearts, we, we, we learn to kind of just say, okay, I'm going to forgive. I'm going to, I'm going to forget. I'm going to bear with each other in love. I mean, it's what every husband and wife do every week, every day. Jesus gives us the peace to live within unity in the church. And Jesus' return is a motivation to live in peace and in holiness. We see that in 2 Peter 3, verse 14. The final verse that's up here. Therefore, dear friends, since you're waiting for these things, that is the return of Christ, strive to be found at peace without spot or blemish when you come into his presence. He's like, and this is Peter, he's talking to churches that are like, you know, undergoing persecution, getting, you know, displaced, and, you know, they're, they're immigrants, they're, you know, they're refugees, and he's like, just whatever you do, strive to be found at peace, just knowing that you are living in the will of God. 
Christ came to bring us peace. I've got a story here. It's my great little storybook. See, Christ is the only one that can bring peace. And I got this great story about how this actually happened. Jesus Christ, the, the birth of Christ, stopped hostility for one day and brought peace between men who were in conflict with each other. This is the Christmas story of peace and love. Over 100 years ago, uh, on the night of December 24th, 1914, soldiers of the British Expeditionary Force and the 5th French Army were huddled down in trenches along the western front near the Belgian town of Flanders. They had ceased combat operations and were preparing a small Christmas celebration. Approximately 250 yards across the combat zone known as No Man's Land, the German 1st and 2nd Armies were doing the same within their own cold and dirty trenches. For both sides, Christmas was a brief respite from a war that was only five months old, but whose horrors of poison gas, heavy artillery, and death by the thousands had already eclipsed anything previously experienced in human history. Sometime around 9 p.m., a company sergeant major in the North Staffordshire Regiment reported to his commander that several dozen German soldiers had climbed out of the trenches and were lighting candles and singing songs. The commander peered out over the parapet and was astonished to see a single unarmed German soldier walking toward them bearing a white flag. He crawled out of the British trench and met the soldier halfway across the battlefield, where he discovered the German had been a waiter in England before the war and was interested in trading cigars for brandy. He took the British commander to a group of German officers and it was agreed that there would be an unofficial truce until midnight of Christmas night. All along the Western Front, hundreds of soldiers on both sides poured out of the trenches into no man's land to celebrate Christmas with the men they had sworn to kill. British 2nd Lieutenant Doug Dugan Chater wrote in a letter that in about two minutes, the ground between the two lines of trenches was swarming with men and officers of both sides, shaking hands and wishing each other a happy Christmas. The opposing sides exchanged candy, liquor, cigarettes, and plum pudding. They roasted a pig. They played an enthusiastic soccer game on the frozen ground, which, according to German Lieutenant Johannes Niemann, was three goals to two in favor of Fritz against Tommy. They sang carols of the season, never caring that some of them sang Steel Nacht, while others sang Silent Night. They helped bury each other's dead, recited prayers for peace together. Not everyone was overcome by the surreal sight of German and British soldiers sitting and laughing together on their own battlefield. Gustav Riebensam of the 2nd Westphalian Regiment wrote in his diary, the whole thing has become slowly ridiculous and must be stopped. Lieutenant Bruce Bainsfeather wrote, It was just like the interval between the rounds in a friendly boxing match. Not for a moment was the will to beat them relaxed. A young Austrian soldier named Adolf Hitler said such an exchange should not be allowed. But as Christmas Eve turned to Christmas Day and the camaraderie continued, most of the men on either side began to think about how this Christmas miracle altered their perception of the conflict in which they were engaged. British soldier Sapper Davy declared, hate for a moment disappeared along the Western Front. Joseph Sebald observed, this was war, but there was no trace of enmity between us. British Second Lieutenant Drummond recalled the German remarking, we don't want to kill you and you don't want to kill us, so why shoot? Inevitably, Christmas came and went, and the time for the resumption of hostilities approached. British and German soldiers bade their new friends farewell, telling each other to stay low, and that they would aim high when ordered to open fire. Several hours later, as, guns, as the guns on what had once again the enemy side went off, a tin can was discovered in a British trench with a piece of paper inside of it that read, We shoot to the air. Thus ended the strangest most unlikely 24 hours any of them would ever experience. According to John McCutcheon, who penned the ballad Christmas in the Trenches, British commander Ian Calhoun was court-martialed along with several others for fraternizing with the enemy. World War I dragged on for four more years at the cost of 38 million total casualties. But for just one day, a small group of ordinary people was able to embrace the humanity of those they had been told were simply targets, and in doing so, was able to totally, temporarily reclaim their own humanity. It's my Christmas wish that 90 more years or 100 more years may not pass before the guns go silent again forever. It's by Nick Barbish. But the reason they stopped was not their humanity. It was because 
2,000 years before, 1,900 years before, a Savior had been born, the Prince of Peace. He is the reason they stopped. He is the one who came to bring us to the path of peace. He can bring us the peace of our soul that we need so desperately, and He can bring us the peace between each other that we need so desperately. God wants us to experience His peace. And Jesus came so that we could have that peace. And so in World War I, in the strangest set of circumstances, the birth of Christ stops this horrific carnage. And men discover what God created them to be, to, to live in harmony with each other. In order to live in harmony with each other, we have to deal with the sin issue. And when we deal with the sin issue, then we deal with the, with the relational issues with each other, and, and we can move up and out in new life in Jesus Christ when we have the peace of God dwelling in our hearts. But you need the Prince of Peace. And once we have the Prince of Peace, then we become the agents of peace. Why do we have a Christmas Eve service? I mean, it's tomorrow. I mean, we just had service on Sunday. Why are we having service tomorrow? Because we want people to know the peace of God. We want you to invite your friends and your, and your neighbors and your family members that don't know Jesus and say, you can have peace. The peace that you don't currently have. And it's found in only one place in Jesus Christ. So we create this opportunity for you to, to be a peacemaker, to guide people to the way of peace, which is Jesus. The team has done a great job preparing for this service this morning. We've got drama, we've got music, we've got wonderful things, but the message really is that they can have peace, they can have joy, they can have love, they can have hope if they have Christ. And that is our joy to celebrate that and to share that with others. Would you just bow with me in prayer as we close? If you don't have peace with God to this morning, I, I, I just invite you today to to receive God's gift of peace to you, Jesus Christ. To in your heart to, to receive Christ as your Savior. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And you can walk in the path of peace knowing Jesus Christ is your Savior. If you've got things in your life you've kind of wandered away from God, today is the day to come back to the Prince of Peace to restore that connection and that, that peace that, that God wants you to experience with Him and with others. If you've got people in your life that you know you're an enemy with, you can, you can bring that concern to the Lord today as well. But Jesus and God, want, we want you to experience peace today. Father, help us to know the peace that passes all understanding. Guide us to the Prince of Peace this morning and this Christmas season. Tomorrow night as people gather here, may they, may they be introduced to the Prince of Peace if they don't already know Him. May the Prince of Peace rule at our tables as we eat together. May, they, may He rule at the Christmas trees where we open gifts together. May He be a key part of everything that we do this Christmas. We pray this in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ.